This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are talking with Roger Scruton about his latest novel, The Disappeared. Roger Scruton is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He's a writer and philosopher, author of over 40 books, including several works of fiction. He has taught in England and in North America at various universities and been a visiting professor in Britain and America. He now lives as a freelance writer in Wiltshire, England. Roger, glad to have you on the program. Well, I'm glad to be on it. Thank you. Roger, why did you write The Disappeared? Very good question. Why does one write anything? <laughs> I guess I had a, a picture in my mind which has been shape, shaping over quite a few years of the uh, situation, first of all, of the teacher in the modern world, and, uh, and secondly, of young people growing up in a, an atmosphere of uh, official multiculturalism where they don't really know what the culture is to which they're supposed to belong, uh, and the confrontation uh, uh, under, underlying all this between our um, rather exhausted post-Christian world and the incoming uh, and far from exhausted Islamic world. So I thought, you know, bring all these together because we've been seeing in Britain exactly all the conflicts that have been emerging from this. Uh, I thought I'll bring them all together in a particular uh, dramatic uh, um, encounter and see if see if I could work it out. So, uh, just thinking about the title, uh, who or what uh, has disappeared uh, in Britain? Uh, well, it's a very the title is ambiguous, of course, and uh, multiply ambiguous. In the story, various people disappear because it's a story about people trafficking. Uh, as, much, as along with other things, but of course, uh, uh, underlying it all, there is the disappearance from uh, our society of the old ideas of authority, the old religion, uh, the old sense of belonging, uh, and uh, I wanted to bring that together with the, you know, the, the actual disappearance of people. So we've got, uh, to my mind, uh, we, 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 we've got really five characters in the novel, uh, all of whom working on various pieces, various problems that they've encountered, dramatic, dramatic problems. And as the novel moves forward, what we start to realize is they're all basically dealing uh, with the same set of facts and the same, the same major problem. Uh, And and that really comes down to sex trafficking uh, within council flats and a city in Northern England, Yorkshire. And uh, this is truly horrific. I want to talk about one character in, in particular, Sharon Williams. Uh, Sharon right. Williams. So how does it come to pass uh, in, in present-day Britain uh, that a girl, uh, 16 years of age, uh, would in effect uh, be left to fend for herself uh, by pretty much everyone except for this teacher who emerges in the novel, uh, Stephen Haycraft, uh, who, is, who is her literature teacher, uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> Sharon's story is actually not an unusual one. She's a, a child of uh, um, <clears throat> neglectful parents, drug addicted, uh, probably, uh, uh, who have sort of essentially abandoned her. So she's taken into care by the local council. This is one of the responsibilities that the councils have in Britain, and there are an awful lot of these girls taken into care, especially in those northern cities where there are real social problems. Uh, And um, then the council puts her into uh, a a home as an adopted child. There was a a certain stage, you know, they they look around for parents who can take take the thing off their hands. So she's put into the hands of a um, a, a working class family at the time it looks as though that's a good solution it's a family with a father in place a few um, a few boys <coughs> and children of a, another mar- of that marriage and so on 
but of course, um, and, and they're living in a council flat in a, in a big, uh, uh, rather sinister tower block called Angel Towers, then, um, you know, the inevitable happens. The man leaves. Uh, other men come in. Uh, you know, uh, uh, she becomes a target for the interests of other people, and in particular, interests of the <clears throat> immigrant families in the neighbourhood. Uh, in particular, uh, an Islamic, uh, a Muslim family from, uh, ultimately from Afghanistan, but also from Yemen, and you know, then she becomes a target, target of uh, of grooming. Uh, and and sexual abuse and, find, and so is a, a kind of rape victim from the age of 15 onwards so this as you and we were talking before the interview you wrote the novel before the uh, the Rotterdam report uh was was published yeah. and released uh, but largely we're talking about uh a similar problem uh that uh in in the novel and also in the Rotterdam report. So in that report, what what we learn is for over a decade, and particularly in these northern towns and in the United Kingdom, uh, we've got uh, basically rape gangs, uh, primarily of of Pakistani British men who are, in effect, they are grooming these girls. Maybe we can be very precise about what that means. And, in effect, trafficking them, uh, applying them with drugs, alcohol. And these girls are largely like Sharon Williams. They are are without parents. They are largely alone. And and there's just really no accountability for what happens to them for over a decade until the facts just become impossible to ignore. Um, And that's, that's kind of what we see in the novel. Yeah, uh, uh, exactly. Uh, in the novel, of course, I don't talk about Pakistani yeah. gangs. Yeah. I make my the two villains into um, essentially uh, Yemenis of Afghani- Afghan origin because I, I didn't want to raise the whole issue of communities and uh, you know and yes. all that. But I did want to raise the issue of the the uh, disparity between the Muslim view of women uh, and uh, the pr- the surrounding culture. And the Muslim view, uh, in particular, of people from from a place like Ye- Yemen, is, is that the, a girl is pure uh, as long as she's protected. Uh, and but if she if, if she if she is taken advantage of, if she's lost her her purity, uh, then she's a fair game for anyone. And of course, the surrounding girls, being all white and not Muslims, are fair game anyway. And once you've got them. Uh, you're a, you're entitled to use them as objects rather than as as people, and this is what has happened to her. But she is very much a person, uh, and um, uh, with a, a huge intelligence. Uh, and in the book, I, I I present really four women, all of whom are distinguished by their their brains. Yes. I mean, there's her, um, there's Laura, who's a high flying, normal middle-class person who's going somewhere who is kidnapped in in the place of her uh, and um, Muhiba who's the the sister of the villains whom they're protecting uh, as something pure uh, and and also has to use her intellect to try and get out of the situation in which she is namely uh, uh, trapped in a Muslim family uh, uh, and, and to be as it were sold in marriage to the effective you know the um, cho- the parents' choice and all the rest, uh, and then there's Iona, the the social worker who has to deal with all these things, uh, who is a kind of uh, lefty, uh, you know, politically correct by her education, but but sees the reality uh, and tries to find a solution. The uh, on this question of price uh, of price and women and different parts of Muslim culture, religion, that this yeah. emerges out of. Uh, I mean, this also was in the Rotterdam report uh, as well, uh, in particular in dealing with these rape gangs and how they understood their victims. Uh, yeah. I mean, this was, this was, this was there uh, and hard, very hard to ignore. Um, uh, in particular, we have in, in one case, just thinking about this, a Muhiba says uh, to Justin Fellows, who is um, uh, an eco- uh, an eco corporate junior executive of some kind, or rising within right. a for profit uh, eco renewal corporation, he makes um, uh, uh, houses that are, uh, what, uh, I guess, carbon neutral. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And so we f- we find him; he's attracted to Mahiba, 
um, and and actually brings her into his company. She's running uh, accounts for him and you know, doing various tasks for him. And he's very attracted to her, and she is unavailable to him uh, in, in many ways. And he realizes this. And she says to him at one point that I'm priceless. Uh, and I'm priceless. Yeah. I'm priceless within my family, uh, and I'm a gift, and, and I'm a gift that yeah. my family makes to another family. Um, uh, this is, in, in, in a way, we've got that. We've got that stark portrayal, and then we've also got sort of the easy come, easy go sort of understanding of sexuality reverberating in Western liberal democracies. Uh, as and I, I think about those two contrasts, and then we've got something else happening as well, which is degradation. Uh, is the only yeah. way to, only way to put it, um, but something else. There's something there's something interesting. Uh, it's almost politically incorrect in your novel. I suppose there's a lot that's politically incorrect by current standards. Both men. We've got Justin Fellows and Stephen Haycraft coming back to the teacher, who are, you know, uh, there's nothing particularly conservative about them, but both of them realize that they have tasks of protecting innocent women as they understand them. Uh, absolutely, both of them are. In search of their manhood, in just the way well, it, uh, that the uh, that the women are in search of their womanhood, uh, uh, but of course the old man-woman distinction has disappeared. It's, it's one disappeared. of the other things that's disappeared, uh, and they're having to find their own way to it. Uh, and in Stephen's case, it's it's precisely the the appeal made to him by Sharon, made very intelligently, uh, so he can't can't avoid it. Uh, that, that that awakens the man in him to disastrous effect, of course. Um, and in the case of Justin, he's been looking for his manhood, you know, in other ways through his his um, addiction to heavy metal yeah. and, uh, and all that. Uh, but also, Mahiba uh, um, arouses him exactly that in him exactly that need to protect. Um, and and because of her purity, she drags him out of the uh, ordinary, easygoing sexual relations to uh, to which he he is accustomed, uh, and gives him another sense of what it might be to be a man, you know, uh, and um, uh, and it's disastrous for him in a way too. Yeah, no, I interesting as well. I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't expecting as I started to read the novel. So Stephen Haycraft, just a little bit of his backstory, is uh, he's an Oxford graduate, uh, does not go into the academy, although he had wanted to, um, had wanted to be a journalist, didn't really succeed there. And he's kind of in a fallback position of teaching at St. Catherine's Academy, which was once uh, yeah. a Roman Catholic school for boys and is now part of the general government education system. Uh, interesting note as well. The chapel of the school is is under lock and key, uh, yeah. <laughs> and that's where he goes. Uh, that's where he goes to yeah. think or to sort through things. Um, yeah, at yeah. one point, even to yeah. read the and I, and I want to talk about the Kassab family in the novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen, but Stephen, as you noted, is is attracted to Sharon, uh, the sixteen year old girl, and, and she appeals to him, and she's telling him what's going on, the hell of life, in the Angel Towers, the Council Flats, through the Tempest. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk talk about that and and how that works on him, but also how he finds the way really to sublimate, I suppose, is his eros from from overwhelming their their relationship. Right. Well, <clears throat> yeah. The, 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 what what she does, she uh, she has, uh, as it were, already conceived because of her her brain and her imagination. She was already conceived a love of of literature. She, being at the school is the only safe place for her. And in school, she's she's studying to, um, Shakespeare and, <clears throat> and other texts, the Great Gatsby and all the A-level, what, what we call the A-level syllabus. And The Tempest is the, um, is the play that she has to study with Stephen. So uh, um, she uses... The symbol is as she uses the play as, in order to, to represent in symbolic form to him through her essays exactly what is going on in the horrible world around her, while at the same time trying to point out that she is innocent, really, that, that she, is, she has kept her purity through this uh, and that she wants to give it to him. Uh, and she does this very cleverly because, you know, obviously he's got to read these essays um, and she's constantly using her language in order to <clears throat> display her very sensitive uh, uh, soul 
and um, so he uh, so uh, he's got to respond. He can't respond just as a teacher. He's got to respond in some other way, um, and uh, that's what he he does do, of course. But but he also has to. Um, he, he, he's also being told through the, me- the, as it were, between the lines, the messages, uh, you know, save me. I, I'm in real trouble. I'm in real danger. And he, he knows that, he's, that, that nobody else is going to save her. He tries, to, he goes to the town council to try and get the social workers involved. Uh, and Iona, who understands the problem, doesn't want to get involved because she knows that the the huge consequences of being involved in the in problems that involve immigrants. So um, eventually, he comes to the conclusion that he alone can save her, and and uh, and he, uh, <coughs> essentially Sharon manipulates him into a position where he has to try, and she ends up living with him. Yeah. The, the interesting in, in these essays uh, that, that she writes to him, uh, we learned that one of her friends was, uh, in effect, captured uh, and, yeah. and was the victim of sex trafficking and uh, somewhere, somewhere sent into Eastern Europe uh, to Russia. Uh, I, I'm, I'm forgetting what you say in the novel, but th- this, is, this is sort of, I mean, I, I think a, a wave of, of realization that comes across Stephen as well, that his sort of you know, not to say indifference, but rather sort of acceptance of of the official line about immigration and uh, life, uh, you know, amongst amongst the working class or underclass is not is not uh, is actually quite vicious, and and this sort of realization comes across him, and that and indeed, as you say, he's really the only one who can save Sharon. Yeah. He turns to yeah. official authorities, and I mean, I think there's also you work in your educational critique here. Uh, he turns to the social worker uh, that, that we mentioned, Yona, and he reads to her part of her essay, which is which is from the Tempest, and mm-hmm. and the social worker says, "Well, she's obviously a racist," and, yeah. and referring and referring to the the Asian community and in, in the flat, and he says, "What do you mean? This is Shakespeare. She's just quoting Shakespeare. It's a play on, on his language." And I I took it as you were saying, "We're a nation of demi or you know a nation of demi educated." therapeutic experts who are afraid of the truth or of expressing the yeah. truth well yes i mean that i, I didn't want to say that but yeah. I, I, just to show it yeah. <laughs> um yeah that this is the situation in which we find ourselves it's uh, inevitably uh, um and we have a, a <clears throat> there's one of the themes of the novel of of course is the the eradication of of our ability to perceive social truths by the um, official political correctness. The police, in particular, who, who also appear in the novel, have been uh, subject to essentially um, silencing orders, <clears throat> not to, not to speak about certain things because it would be uh, offend the official multiculturalist doctrine, uh, the doctrine that you know that that. The immigrants don't have different values, uh, or, or rather, their values are to be accepted and, and not to be criticised, uh, and all the rest. Yeah, no, I mean that's and that's also the way I understand it. Um, the idea that uh, official authorities will speak only with sort of the uh, uh, appointed private authorities of these communities on various matters, <laughs> and will let them run things, but won't actually peer or pry. So, part of you, you mentioned in the novel. Um, through a conversation that Stephen has with a police officer, or, or is it, no, I'm sorry, Justin Fellows has with a police officer about the disappearance of, of Muhiba, who he believes has been kidnapped by her family. We learn later it's more complicated than that. The police officer yeah. uh, of some rank, a reluctant to intervene, and he cites the McPherson report. Uh, what right. was that? Is that still reverberating around, <laughs> even, oh, yeah, even in light of the Rotterdam report and the, the, the ruckus that it's caused? It's uh, it's from before the Rotherham report, and it concerned um, that there were a, a case of a, a black boy being murdered by uh, um, uh, various white thugs while he was standing at a bus stop in London. It was a terrible thing, and it wasn't properly reported or properly investigated by the police. So the case had to be reopened. Uh, and uh, at the same time, because of all the complaints that this was a racist attack and that the police were covering it up, um, a senior judge, Scottish judge, who was put, called in, uh, McPherson, to to conduct this uh, investigation and report on it. And he reported that the police in it, that all the facts show that the police in England 
are essentially uh, uh, racist or institutionally racist. That as a piece of jargon taken over from leftist sociology in order to um, <clears throat> describe the entire police force. And of course, the result of this was hugely demoralizing. And the police, the immediate reaction of the police is to say, exactly as this superintendent does, uh, you know, we're going to steer clear of the immigrant communities. We're not going to ever get to uh, expose ourselves to the possibility of this accusation because it will just simply uh, undermine all the work that we're doing. So um, this had the negative effect of meaning that the immigrant communities are no longer properly policed. And that's what we see, not only in my novel, but also in the Rotherham case. They haven't been policed at all. And when somebody tried to police, well, tried to report on this, uh, she was, all her funding was withdrawn and she herself was marginalized and essentially almost criminalized for having said the truth. We've got, I mean, interesting uh, in just tying this together uh, with, with the plight of Mahiba, who is, who is a, a woman who wants to enter British society uh, on her own terms and, and wants yeah. to enter largely without her culture and religion behind her, but, you know, has, but has you know, something of um, you know, a modern liberal Democrat. She says she's an atheist, um, yeah. and yet she can't. And, and the reasons she can't. why she can't are actually tied to what we're discussing. Uh, that is that is to say we we have the you know the uh, aversion of official authorities to actually allow individuals within these communities to come out uh, and and be on their own precisely because there's going to be there is this official private authority that's just kind of upheld uh, and, and inhibits actually uh, a healthy individualism uh, from emerging and you know from actually seeing that develop. And so we get something like a, it's a strange, I mean, the novel, as I was thinking about it, we've got, we've got a welfare state, we've got multiculturalism, and then we've got kind of, in some dialectical way, working a cult of autonomy. Uh, and yeah. all of this sort of leads to wolves preying on sheep, uh, in my mind. And in the end, Muhiba, not only can she not leave, uh, she's actually murdered by someone uh, from her community for her um, involvement uh, in, yeah. uh, in, in trying to set right what she realizes her two brothers have been doing, which is sex trafficking. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and, and she, although she wants to move from her community, and although she is in her own way, own somewhat calculating way, in love with Justin, um, her purity remains at the top of her agenda through all these things uh, because, uh, that you know, that's what her education in the Muslim family has in, uh, has in, uh, induced in her, this sense that uh, you know, a, 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 a conception of her sexuality which she cannot, um, cannot possibly discard. Uh, and um, in a sense, that's a really admirable thing that she can't discard it, but it, but it leads her inevitably um, in, the, in a tragic direction. Yeah, the... Uh, interesting, um, you know, we're talking about uh, Islamic families. There's another Islamic family in the novel, uh, the Kassab family. Yeah. And the, so we, we have two boys uh, in this family. Uh, they're from, they're Shiite uh, Muslims from Iraq. Uh, they make their way to England. Um, they're also in the council flats. And, but this father is, um, uh, I, I suppose we could say uh, liberal. He makes a point uh, at, at one point, although without without losing his Islamic faith in any sense, he makes a, a statement to his sons, if I remember correctly, uh, that the gates of interpretation aren't closed or, or shouldn't be yeah. closed. Um, and that's exactly. and, that, and that's yeah. I think that's that's a profound statement in terms of thinking about creative renewal within Islam. Uh, could you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, well, he Abdul Kassab is is my sort of hero in all this in a way yeah. i mean he is somebody who who brings to in, uh, he 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 comes to england first of all legitimately and he's somebody who's been put into the an impossible situation by being an interpreter for our forces during the um, capture of basra in the old saddam hussein conflict uh, and uh, so he has to be rescued and he he's tr genuinely grateful he wants to he wants to integrate he doesn't want to lose his Islamic faith, and he's also a scholarly person, a school teacher himself, um, who's immersed in that a beautiful old uh, Shiite uh, and Sufi tradition, of which was centered on Basra originally, uh, and he teaches this to his children, to his two uh, sons, 
uh, and uh, uh, and his view is yes the, we, here we are in a in another world from the one that we were brought up in but we can adapt to it and we can adapt our, our, our faith to it because our faith doesn't tell us uh, you know to to impose ourselves on others regardless of what they want it tells us to set an example and that's what he tries to do uh, and of course his son Farid is um, who loves him deep, dearly also uh, comes to love Stephen his teacher um, because he's so uh, uh, as it were obedient to the need to fit in he wants to find an object of love there uh, in the new in his new community uh, and he's a rather touching boy I think in my well at least as I read it um, uh, and of course sees what's happening to Stephen from a distance but is able in a way to reach out uh, to help him. He also has, he notices as well, uh, Muhiba. And, yes, and uh, he falls in love with her, yeah. He is, yeah, he's very much in love with her and and and, and, and does, and I remember in the novel attends her, and not a funeral, uh, but yeah. uh, some, some sort of uh, service that's held for her. Uh, none of her family, yeah. uh, no, none of her family members attend uh, because she's been, no, no. She's, she's impure now. Uh, in their yeah. mind, um, I, but I, as, I, as I read the Kassab family, there are also there's the quotations of scripture uh, from uh, from the New Testament, uh, from the Old Testament yeah. that the father makes. This is uh, it's not it's not it's not a it's not a loopy syncretism. It's it's an awareness of the range of of human inquiry into the divine yeah. and the value of that. Uh, but in a way, as I, as I thought about it, maybe the larger question that the father confronts is in England that itself is um, uh, not 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 unsure, but quite frankly dismissive of its of its religious spiritual core. Yeah, and, uh, and what must he think? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, all he can think is to is to um, stay within his certainties and, and communicate them to his sons, you know, <clears throat> and um, hope that uh, his sons will be okay. Yeah, but he is. Yeah, I, I, this is one of the. Uh, underlying scenes, of course, of, of the book. Now, the, your your character, uh, Laura Markham, uh, the lawyer. Yeah. We've mentioned her briefly. Is, uh, you know, is a young uh, upper middle class woman, uh, rising, career minded, focused, all of that. Uh, and uh, you know, she's the one mistakenly taken uh, for sex trafficking purposes because she's put up in a in an apartment near the Angel Towers. They think they're getting yep. Sharon Williams, um, yep. and they get her. And but I, I guess I wonder: Did you put her in the novel uh, to say, in effect, these problems won't stay contained within the Angel Towers? Uh, well, I, I, they, I, I, they will I, actually reach out and touch the upper middle class white lawyer. That, that, that of course, is the the purpose of beginning the novel like that, and also. <clears throat> And to in her story, I always give. I tell it in the second person uh, case. You know, uh, she is you. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. that's part of the narrative. And so the reader is actually, uh, as it were, yeah. totally identified with her, uh, and seeing, uh, and she's discovering bit by bit what it is this world into which she's fallen, and and the, uh, and the reality of it from her. Her dream world of being the successful middle class graduate, you know, investigative accountant. Uh, everything is lies before her. Although she's already had her troubles with men, yeah. But she's trying to. She's also trying to keep her purity in the only form that it's available to an, you know, an upwardly mobile English girl. But you you discover, of course, through implications that she's had a Catholic upbringing, been to a private school. You know, uh, 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 absorbed quite a lot of um, old-fashioned literary and musical experiences. <clears throat> she's not um, she's not the ordinary uh, piece of material that you would that would fall into people tra- trafficking, and yeah. um, that's part of the point. Yeah, if, if anybody yeah. else, if anybody else had fallen into it, uh, it, the story would have a very different ending. But because she is what she is and has that uh, extraordinary uh, that, uh, you know, uh, understanding of things, immediate understanding of things, she's able to lift one of her abusers, uh, Eunice, out of his situation 
and give him for the first time the image of something else and that's how she rescues herself and you don't know at the end of the story whether Eunice himself might one day be rescued. Yeah, no, they're interesting as well. Part of Laura's uh, rescue, uh, you know, she, she's able to, you know, by her wits really uh, outmaneuver and, and, and get out of the confinement she's in. Uh, yeah. Part of her healing is to reach out, and as we were discussing, the, all of these characters converge. And so she reaches out and she becomes, uh, in effect, another uh, savior for, for Sharon. Uh, for Sharon yeah. Williams and and their connections, of course, they've been raped. Um, uh, that's yeah. one connection, but it's it's the realization on Laura's part. Uh, I, I think that she too is is one of the only ones who could save Sharon from her from her fate. That's right, but also she 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 feels this because actually Sharon saved Laura. Yes, uh, it's it's Sharon's uh, it's the example of Sharon holding on to her purity and the ability to love through all that she has suffered, which tells Laura that this is possible. Uh, and then she identifies with Sharon, and, uh, and they, they, as it were, lift each other up. The, the, the question uh, as well, I mean, just sexuality within the novel, um, you're thinking about uh, uh, this, this discussion. Uh, is there something within, uh, within the popular mindset uh, that... that that struggles to even understand this idea of a of a relational uh, of a relational commitment of sexuality that has uh, in part that it contributes in some way to this. I mean, this isn't just this isn't just pure violence going on in the novel. It's it's in a way, and we see this through the two male characters, maybe uh, of sexuality as expressive individualism versus relational commitment. And is it the thing that the latter we really can't dispense with it as much as we want, though, even though we want to. Well, uh, it, it, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's been an, a theme of my writing for quite a long time, ever since I wrote the book on sexual desire, which came out, what, in 1986, I think, um, 30 years ago. Uh, that, yes, that, that, um, <clears throat> that sexual desire is not the thing that, that it's been caricatured as being by the Kinsey Report and by you know, uh, American campus uh, uh, habits, it, it is something completely different. It's, it's a, a, a wanting of the other individual, a wanting of him or her for the thing that he or she is, and, uh, and also the urge towards commitment, towards existential choice is, is implanted in the heart of it. And that is a theme throughout the novel, of course. Uh, it's, a, it's the only it's the only reason why rape is a crime equivalent to murder. It's a crime equivalent to murder because sexual desire is not the sort of thing that people like Alfred Kinsey try to try to make it out to be. It is a thing which in which one's very existence as an individual is bound up, and that is especially true, of course, for a woman. Uh, and and all the, the women in the story make this entirely clear. The, on on this theme of love and existential choice, Justin Fellows, uh, you know, you, you, the, the the facts were given in the novel is this is someone ascending uh, in the world of envirepreneurialism or something like that, um, yeah. green capitalism. Uh, and Justin Fellows, when when Mahuba is taken from him, as he believes, um, one day, and, and he can't find her. And he he needs he related to Stephen and that and that what he wants to find and protect and he can't do it he he quickly loses all interest uh, in his career which has meant so yeah. much to him um, and his solace is in heavy metal uh, yeah uh, and, and and I think you know the the social worker coming back she she reemerges she's really the only one that he he finds a connection with in that in that space until until Laura returns um, or. Yeah. Uh, Maybe talk about that a little bit, and and what he's discovering about himself that he's casually dismissed most of his life. Well, yeah, I, I, he, he is, um, as you say, he's sort of eco capitalist type. Uh, I mean, he is somebody who's like all um, uh, good people. He started life with ideals. He's gone through the modern university education system, in which ideals are not the the, the old religious self-sacrificing ideals, but they are the new 
um, political, egalitarian, uh, um, uh, and uh, sort of anti-capitalist ideals, the, the, the ideals of um, people who feel that the world must be put to right rather than that, that, rather than that the self should be put to right. So he sets about finding a career, in, uh, and because he, he, he's part of the environmental movement, he's very lucky, he finds a, a career plastering the Yorkshire moors with wind farms, um, which, of course, is an extremely dubious sort of thing in the end. Everybody knows that they have uh, virtually no effect on the environment and also destroy a beautiful piece of countryside. And he comes, of course, to see this. Um, he, uh, and he comes to see that his, his environmental enthusiasms are not only... Uh, um, uh, misplaced because it, you know it's not going to do any good, but also that they are a cover for something else for his for his lack uh, of uh, the real manhood that that he needs and the real manhood his need for this is is made clear by Mahiba precisely by by her refusal of him uh, you know that that this is that a real man has to break through. The, uh, the incredible barrier by which she is surrounded, and he doesn't know how to do it. Uh, and in his puzzlement, of course, he does. He takes refuge in his um, love for heavy metal. He's a good, he's a bass player himself, and he can, you know, he, he really understands it. So one of the one of the themes is actually uh, um, the way in which someone like that can find his lost masculinity, uh, as it were, returned to him through. Uh, heavy metal uh, and I think this is something that you see very much in America actually the way in which um, a lot of your motorcycle gangs who are obviously as we know from recent events yeah. Uh, yeah. in desperate search of their masculinity and will take any method to get hold of it you know how heavy metal also has a very great importance for them uh, you know this is this is the way in a world which has been as it were feminized in which the women have taken over but also rejected the men as the feminists do you know that that, that it's uh, men are in many ways lost how do i become a real man again and uh, so i i go into some of the you know the thoughts behind the the heavy metal groups and uh, and also the the style of their music too yeah no you you do that at length in, in the novel um uh and i i I, I thought that was so uh, uh, an interesting turn in, in in relationship to to music. However, uh, with with the heavy metal, uh, Justin has as he's with with Laura uh, in the novel, and she is dealing with kind of the the fallout and the trauma of her of her rape ordeal. Mm-hmm. Um, he begins rediscovering classical music uh, with her, which I thought was an interesting sort of way that, yeah. in a way. Perhaps what you were signaling is uh, his manhood has found maybe a more appropriate channel uh, with Laura. Also realizing the, as, as you were just saying, the falseness of the egalitarian uh, enviro ideals he had, and and he's so he's he's actually what he's finding is is a center, and and as a result, the heavy metal becomes of lesser importance. That that's right. Yeah, he find he he does actually find his manhood through Laura, as she finds her feminine uh, femininity through him. Uh, so there is there are, there is a happy ending as well as some pretty tragic endings in in the book. Um, yeah. Stephen uh, Stephen Haycraft will go to jail, um, and he, he, yeah. for a for a year uh, uh, for uh, false imprisonment of Sharon. Uh, she comes to live with him. Finally, he he avoids that. He avoids it. He avoids it, and then finally, he realizes he has to take her in, uh, or she's she's, yeah. she's going to be killed. Um, she's going to be captured. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. he, he does that, but yet he, he is kind of a a part of his character of uh, a reluctance uh, to go ahead and and tell authorities that he has her. Uh, he delays yeah. that. He enjoys having her in his in his apartment. Uh, even though no sexual relations pass, he just it, likes being with her that much. I think, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and he's gonna—he's really the one. He's really the the sacrificial lamb here. Uh, he's gonna lose his career. Uh, uh, hard to recover from the the taint of pedophilia, and that's not what he engaged in. Uh, um, yeah. But uh, and, and in fact, I think she's she would be of the age of sexual consent in any event. But it's all it's all there for him. You know, he to. Become a man involves involves becoming uh, a victim of some kind uh, in 
in the country, as you note, you note um, th- there's this hysteria over pedophilia because it seems to be the last yeah. sort of sexual wrong acknowledged. That's right. That's uh, uh, um, in our society because everything is permitted. There's a desperate need to find the thing that's not permitted, and children are the last remaining. Uh, <clears throat> area of innocence the last thing that can be polluted so uh, you know we, we we're constantly aware that at least that must be held on to um, but also for that very reason people become obsessed with the, with it um, the, the, you know the the taking away of innocence the, uh, the gap the the transition from innocence to knowledge in the sexual sphere is a fundamental part of of sexual morality. So this is the last little bit where real sexual morality still has a, a some kind of presence in people's lives. And that's one reason why we see all this hysteria about paedophilia, which has been incredibly strong in Britain, uh, uh, as you might have seen recently. Yeah. People yeah. going back uh, uh, 50 years in order to unearth something from somebody's life that will destroy his career on the edge of the grave, you know, Mm. will destroy him on the edge of the grave. Uh, um, And, of course, Stephen falls into this trap, even though, as you say, Sharon is... Um, has reached the age of consent. Nevertheless, uh, you know, teacher, pupil, priest, uh, confessor, uh, confess, uh, confessional uh, relations uh, have been targeted in particular because they seem to provide the opportunity uh, uh, that everybody uh, is obsessed by. So he uh, he becomes a target uh, for this. And uh, and once you once you're uh, uh, tarred with that brush, that's the end of your life. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, but, but, yeah, there is, there is, I mean, there's, uh, as was, you think about, uh, Stephen, I suppose there's perhaps hope, uh, in, in what's happened, uh, and, uh, you know, that, that somehow, <laughs> that somehow he emerges. Yeah. He does meet Sharon at the end, who is at this yeah. point a university student and seems, seems yeah. on her way to a much better life. Uh, and, yeah. and perhaps she, that's, she, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, she hasn't forgotten her obligation to him and she will you know the reader feels that she will save him yeah. but she's going to have to make a lot of sacrifices yes i'm um, uh just thinking about uh you know in general you know i was i was wondering if um uh all of these sorts of events have been incredibly controversial i mean at times as, as i'm interviewing here I, I feel like i'm walking on eggshells i wonder if i wonder uh, how, how 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 is the something like the rotterham report does that does that have any sort of long lasting impact? Any sort of uh, wow, fourteen hundred girls uh, preyed upon over the course of ten years and nothing was done. Does that does that have any sort of impact long term, or is or are things well, or is it just lost, or is the war lost? Well, um, I, I just don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm hoping that um, I think uh, you know what uh, I'm hoping that obviously things will change. But it, but it needs a change in the culture. It's not just enough to have a change in policing. No, yes. We we have to wake up to the things that have disappeared and try and <clears throat> recapture them. And it means uh, being much more serious about young people and their predicament than we are. And it's not as though it's confined to England. It's all over the Western world. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we abandon young people <clears throat> to their sexual sexual fortune so to speak and it's very obvious on american campuses we just let things go out of hand and then of course all kinds of self-inflicted punishments and, and revenge uh, uh, movements come up and come into being everything moves into a state of antagonism and chaos uh, i think you know we, we're at a crucial point I, i'm hoping that uh, you know, in an ideal world, my novel would be a bestseller everywhere, especially on the American campus, and everybody would realize, yes, of course, mm-hmm. sex is the thing, this kind of thing, you know, that has to be protected and people must be, must reincorporate it into a proper uh, uh, sense of their cultural identity and all the rest. Um, I doubt that that will happen. <laughs> if it sells a, if it sells a hundred copies, at least that would be good. No, I, I, I think it's going to sell more than a hundred copies. I was wondering. So, what's? It, it, I mean, it came out in the last few months. What's the reaction you're getting uh, presently? Well, I think uh, everybody I 
who I speak to who's read it has been uh, moved by it. Uh, but, um, you know, it hasn't got very widely reviewed yet. Uh, it gets it's Amazon reviews and those sort of things. I just have to w wait and see if it catches on. It's only been out for a month or two. So, um, but I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm hoping that someone will pick it up here uh, like you have done. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it'd be great if it could be reviewed in National Review or somewhere like that, but I, I, I need to do some work on that, I guess. I, I, I can tell you there will be a review in Law and Liberty uh, quite soon um, uh, oh, th that I have scheduled. I, I suppose maybe as, uh, you know, as, as we end, uh, in, in a way, I, I, I think the, the novel gripped me, not just the story. I think you have a very compelling story, uh, one that I think could actually be made into a film. I think it would be an incredible film. Uh, but in a way, we have, I think, the ultimate indictment of of left liberalism, uh, of of a very of a of a pervasive kind, and and its commitments, which seem to prevent and dissuade people from dealing with horrible accounts of abuse. It seems to me there's there's just no greater indictment of an ideology, and and the combination, as I was saying, of multiculturalism, the welfare state, and the sort of cult of autonomy, than what you've revealed in the novel. And so, um, I, I've enjoyed reading it and discussing it with you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, bye. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.